Okay, so we're now recording. So welcome to a UNCG Libraries Minerva's Academic Curriculum, MAC, um, session on information literacy scaffolding in MAC courses. Slides going. So my name is Sam Harlow. Um, I'm here as like, again, kind of the moderator of a lot of these webinars, but also in my role as the uh, former slash still kind of doing some stuff with it, um, health and wellness faculty fellow. Jenny, you can introduce yourself. I'm Jenny Dale. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the information literacy coordinator in the libraries, um, as well as a liaison librarian, and I am also a past MAC faculty fellow for foundations. Lots of Fs. Hello, I'm Amy. I am, um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the head of research, outreach, and instruction in the libraries. I'm currently serving as the chair of the general education council um, i was also the co-chair of the general education revision task force um, and i serve as the liaison to human development and family studies counseling and education development and specialized education services so i dropped this link in the chat um, and i'll drop it again in case anyone entered late but here are the slides we'll also send you all the slides in the um, recording you know when we send the recording over email as well um, so here they are and it's at go.uncg.edu winter pd 21 lib mac when i made this link i was like it's probably too long but that's where my brain was at so um there it is in the chat so to start off, Amy's going to talk about an introduction to Mac at UNCG. Yes. So um, Minerva's academic curriculum is um, the new general education program for UNCG. It started back in August officially. So um, this semester, the first group of new first time fresh people, fresh first year students are um, are taking classes in Minerva's academic curriculum. It is a competency based program. There are 11 competencies um, and students must complete one course in each of those 11 competencies um, for a total of 33 to 34 credit hours. Um, each competency has a set of student learning outcomes associated with it that all the courses in that competency must address. And information literacy is present in two of the 11 competencies, the health and wellness competency and the foundations competency. Um, and as you can see here, the MAC website is mac.uncg.edu. And I mean, I guess, if anybody has any questions about the Mac or would like me to talk more about it, I'm happy to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Also, please feel free to ask at the end or whenever. So here is the list of the 11 competencies. Um, as you can see, you got foundations and health and wellness. We also have um, written communication, oral communication, um, we have three critical thinking classes. Students have to take a critical thinking class in the humanities and fine arts, one in social and behavioral sciences, and one in the natural sciences. Um, so yeah, so the, the math works out to um, 11 classes times three credits is 33. And most of the data analysis and interpretation classes have a lab attached to them. So that's where the 34th hour comes in, just in case you're wondering how that all goes down. Um, also, as far as sort of new, new things in this, the health and wellness competency is new. Our previous general education program didn't have that. Um, we also didn't have a diversity and equity component, um, and we didn't have a required foundations course. So that's the MAC competencies. Okay, so I'm going to take over at this point and talk a little bit more about information literacy, scaffolding, and the MAC program. Um, 
as I was trying to push the slide ahead, but I can't do that unless I suddenly develop magic. Um, so I just wanted to give a definition of information literacy in case it is um, a new concept, or really, I just think we can always use a refresher of this definition. So uh, here at UNCG, we mostly embrace the definition by the Association of College and Research Libraries that information literacy is the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. So you'll see some of that similar language and definitely this sort of conceptual backing of that um, reflected in the outcomes for the, the information literacy specific outcomes for foundations and health and wellness. And so I have all the foundations outcomes listed here, but I have um, uh, in, bold, in bold font to have four and five critically evaluate information and media sources in a variety of formats and incorporate and cite sources accurately and correctly. And so this is what we are looking for um, in terms of the information literacy component of the foundation's student learning outcomes. The health and wellness student learning outcomes, um, there's a bit of overlap. So you see that number four here is the same as number five on the foundation student learning outcomes, integrate and cite sources accurately and correctly. Um, but we have added something new or something different here to health and wellness, which is that third one, to synthesize information from multiple sources to support arguments and or informed decisions. This could be happening in the foundation's courses. Really also, that, that this might be a good moment for me to say that Information literacy could be happening at, um, could be and often is happening in many MAC courses, not just these two competency areas, um, because we often see research papers, research projects in oral communication, written communication, and the humanities and the fine arts, all, all of the, really all of the competency areas. But this is where we are focusing on it um, in these two courses, these two competencies. So again, I've just sort of pulled them out here so that it's they're a little larger to read, honestly. So you can see again the overlap um, of those the, the second one for each that's listed here. And so in the foundations course, the focus is really on evaluation of information in different formats. Um, and the idea is that hopefully by the time you're in a health and wellness um, course, you know, you not that you're ever done knowing the best ways to critically evaluate information, but you've had some practice with it. And then you can kind of build on those skills to be able to um, synthesize information from various sources that you have already evaluated. So I want to talk briefly here about instructional scaffolding. Um, it's a really critical concept um, in, in teaching, and it's, I think, particularly applicable to something like a general education program like MAC. Um, so uh, Wood and colleagues um, are often credited with using this sort of scaffolding metaphor first in the late 70s. Um, so they talked about the way that novice learners could be supported, scaffolded, by experts, or in this, you know, in this case, it was really children and adults that they were talking about, but this idea that they could have scaffolding sort of built into their learning experiences to help them develop um, the skills necessary to complete tasks or to gain other their new skills. And this is kind of a lengthy bit from, uh, from Wood and colleagues. Um, but basically the idea is um, when you are involved in providing and or developing and designing instructional scaffolding, you are focusing often on one thing at a time so that you can then build on that piece. So the example or the, the way they describe it in this quote is they really talk about um, the, uh, the adult, again, they use adult and child, but we could use teacher and learner. Um, the, the teacher controls some of the elements of, of the concepts being learned um, so that the learner can really concentrate and they can really develop, um, develop their skills and learn uh, more about something that they can then kind of with the assistance and with the skills that they have built, then they can build on that and further develop their competence in related tasks. So my favorite definition is from Andrea Baer. Um, and one of the reasons I like the way that um, Baer 
describes this is just sort of the way this idea that scaffolding is very widely discussed um, as a way to approach learning, like just we structure our learning, um, involves opportunities for incremental learning experiences that build on students' prior knowledges, prior knowledge and skills. So I'm really focused on that idea of incremental, like we're not just saying, um, okay, here's a, you know, you're new to this, here's a big research paper and you need to have 20 sources and make sure you cite them accurately and use them all um, to be able to make your argument, right? We're trying to incrementally build our students up to where they can be, they can have that kind of competence and that kind of, um, you know, information literacy skills to be able to do that kind of work. And also that we're, you know, recognizing here that students come to us with lots of experience with information and with sources um, that we can build on and use as part of that scaffolding. And it can happen over the course of a major or a, or a curriculum, often through curriculum mapping. Um, we can see this in the design of the MAC program, as I've noted on this slide, because the uh, ideal situation is that students take a foundations course early in their um, time at UNCG. Um, and that way we have a sense that many students will take that course first and a health and wellness competency course later, so that we know again that we are building, building some of that scaffolding into the program itself. Um, I will also mention that in MAC, competencies are meant to go beyond the MAC program, right? So when you're in your major, you should still, there are still going to be lots, hopefully lots of opportunities to practice and build information literacy skills. This can also happen in a single course, which I think is relevant for MAC as well, because um, we have talked a bit and there's a whole different presentation that I've done about this, but how you can scaffold um, throughout one single course, like throughout the semester to help sort of, again, activate those skills and incrementally build them. So I'll also talk about foundations because again, I was the faculty fellow for foundations and I love foundations. So this is really all about um, connecting students to UNCG. Um, and then also thinking about how to transition to UNCG specifically and to sort of university life in general, and also combines that with information literacy um, and other sort of transferable skills. So I think of it as this kind of equation. Foundations courses are academic content plus transition to college plus information literacy. It's kind of a lot. It's kind of a lot. And you've seen these SLOs, so we can pass by those. I just wanted them to be up there again. Just so that you know, there is a rubric um, for each competency. Um, and the rubric for, um, thank you, Sam, the rubric for foundations includes uh, those information literacy um, student learning outcomes that are in there. So you can get a sense of how, how are we going to be trying to measure these. And they're, one of the things I love about working with foundations is that there's lots of cool and weird courses. And I mean weird in like a great, fantastic way. Um, so I have a couple on this slide um, that are courses, just to give you a sense of the range. There are actually a ton in philosophy that I was trying to choose between, but I thought, you know, good and evil feels, feels right. Um, there is a, uh, so since you have these slides, you can look at this later, but we do have a link out to where you can look at the, um, courses that have been accepted in MAC and you can filter, uh, well, really you're searching by competency and you can just get a sense of like, what a, what a wide range of foundations courses there are. Same with other competencies, but again, I'm talking foundations right now. And I just wanna give you a couple of examples of different library and foundations partnerships that have already happened. Very exciting, this is the first semester of MAC, but we have done some fun stuff. Um, so I spoke with our visual art and humanities librarian, Maggie Murphy, um, to see, because I knew she had been working with the Art 105 Foundation Seminar, which is actually a really large enrollment class um, that still manages to function really well in a seminar kind of as a seminar. Um, so she has done a lot of work with them. And so I just want to give you a sense that 
she works with them in multiple ways, even through the in one semester. So she gives an interactive session about developing a research practice for artists. She's embedded in their Canvas course where she participates. And then she also throughout the semester, I think this is a really cool idea, shares different videos of artists talking about their own approaches to research. And then I've got two more here. Um, CCI one's a classic classical civilizations 117, the Spartans. Um, and I worked with this course um, and I gave them an interactive research workshop where they really focused on, we talked a lot about just navigating the library website and so forth. Um, and then we did some activities about understanding the functions of different kinds of sources. Um, this course is uh, extremely well designed uh, in terms of information literacy scaffolding. Um, so the, this is a great example of a course where throughout the semester students are turning in different sources that they might want to use. Um, you know, again, incrementally working up to a big research paper. And then finally, succeed at the GFYE 101, which is certainly the highest enrollment course because they're, at least this fall, there were 50 sections of the course. Um, and I have worked with Melody Rood, our student success and open education librarian, to create content, including both a slide deck that's used by instructors in the course. And Melody has worked on um, and created an asynchronous Canvas module that students use while they're actually preparing to find materials for a group project. And I'll turn it over to Sam. Sorry, I spoke so long, Sam. No, oh, I don't think it, I mean, I think it was great. Um, so similar to what Jenny is, we just wanted to re-emphasize the competency for health and wellness again. So courses in this competency intensely focus on health and wellness, as well as information, information literacy. These courses provide explicit instruction on in how to understand decisions as they impact health and wellness of individuals or communities. And one thing I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit when we give examples the way Jenny get, did of like what the library has been done doing working with these courses. Um, but I think something that comes up a lot with the health and wellness competency is people make an assumption like, oh, well, all the courses must be in health sciences or like HHS, but that is not at all the case. There's a good amount of representation from humanities, um, including philosophy, um, that the online um, bachelor's of liberal studies, BLS, um, English, which we're going to talk about one example of that, of Jenny working with an English class with health and wellness. So again, um, I think that that was one of the kind of, I don't want to say controversies, but like hesitancies of putting this within a general education format, right, that it was too subject specific. But again, um, we've seen that it's very interdisciplinary and um, turned out to be super relevant in the time that we live in. Uh, who could have predicted? So um, again, just a reminder, I know Jenny already um, talked about these. Um, here are the four uh, student learning objectives for health and wellness uh, MAC courses. Um, and the two ones at the top are really, to me, like very instructor specific. Um, and you can see here then that flowing into the information literacy part, right? That's where, again, the librarian and the instructor of record can really work together and develop uh, materials based on that. So uh, again, another thing that we really wanted, and um, Amy could talk about this too, because she helped develop all of these as well. Um, and I was on the working group that came up with these student learning objectives. It, we really wanted it to be a very holistic approach to health and wellness. So you can see here, we also are including mental health and then well-being. you know, again, thinking about it, um, like, I guess, like, you remember, I remember like those first meetings were like, are these PE courses? And you're like, no, they're again, these like, uh, we're looking at it larger than, you know, specifically a PE course. So um, Jenny talked about this too. There's a link here to a draft of the rubric to help us to assess the health and wellness competencies. Um, and Amy is a part of the general education committee. So if y'all have any questions about assessment and what they're doing, uh, feel free. But I am because I think we do have a little bit of time where I could do this. Oh, oh no. Well, usually I wanted to show you what it looked like, but oh well. Um, I can get fix that link. But again, it's a nice rubric. And it, again, it can help instructors really think through how you can make sure that you are implementing these student learning objectives and how you can assess them moving forward. So um, I did want to say this um, is that um, there, you know, information literacy is, of course, something that we in the library help a lot with. But something that is coming up a lot that we want to talk about with Mac is how important it is to think about it co curricularly. 
that word, they're thinking about all the other units across campus that could help um, with uh, these kind of fit courses. Because again, we see that, um, you know, Mac is a new thing and that we want to all support each other. And these are just some of the ones that do a lot of great stuff concerning health and wellness. So Counseling Center, Kaplan Center, um, but then also, you know, something to think about is the Weatherspoon Art Gallery. They do a lot of great stuff with uh, visual literacy and looking at health resources. Um, and again, uh, just anything that you can think of across campus, a lot of them are excited to help and think through how they could come in and provide materials as well. Um, and then again, similar to what Jenny said, if you go to the UNCG um, course proposal page and then search health, it's the only competency that says health in it. I'm like, gosh, are all the links broken? No, this one works. Um, you can just scroll down Right, and there's a table um, and it's updated pretty, pretty regularly, but you can at least see what was done in the fall in terms of approved. But again, here you can just search health, right? And you can see all the stuff that's listed with health and wellness. Um, so again, you can see stuff from like counseling, um, community and therapeutic rec, but also again, dance, English, BLS, um, public health, kinesiology, nutrition. So again, religion has a lot of courses um, and more. So again, it's, I think, um, I, I love looking at this and showing that because I think, again, it shows you, again, the interdisciplinary approach to health and wellness at UNCG. Okay, so these are the examples that I wanted to show, um, and I can go back in here and add links, but I, again, I just really want to talk through some examples of how library have been doing this kind of information literacy scaffolding that Jenny talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Um, but one that I work with is community and therapeutic recreation, where we have a leisure and American, it's called leisure and American lifestyles. So this is an online asynchronous course, it's pretty high enrollment, um, it has uh, one large section of 50 to 70 students, depending on the semester. Um, and I've been working with the professor of that course, Joan Sutton, on um, different ways that we can incorporate the information literacy component because um, she already had really the um, first two student learning objectives well covered within the health and wellness uh, student learning objectives. But we built activities in Canvas pages. I was embedded within Canvas um, around the information literacy competencies, particularly looking at synthesizing it. They already had to go out and find the health information, but we worked on having them cite the information and where they got it from and evaluate whether it was appropriate information um, as well. And we won a fellowship with ERSCO, Undergraduate Research Studies Center, you know, the whole ERSCO, Undergraduate Research Studies is what I'm going to show it and say it say it, wow, words. But anyway, we are going to be upping that even more, and we're going to be developing a full module on research, as well as um, more graded activities, and then a reflection component on how they can really view research and information literacy while they're using health and thinking about health and leisure throughout their um, life and careers. So another one is um, CED 274, Stress Management. Amy, who's in here, works with that class, and they developed a research guide, similar to what Jenny said, activities, um, and teaching information literacy sessions. Uh, so again, a kind of, again, scaffold of approach. And then Jenny is here, talked about English 240 health and wellness and cultural context, where she provided a workshop on health information literacy um, with a focus on uh, high quality popular sources. I wanted to show these three examples or talk about these three examples to really talk about, again, that this, um, the library and Matt courses is really gonna rely a lot on our liaison model, as well as um, archivists who are um, connected to the subject, where it's not gonna be just me coming in and talking about health and wellness. It could be the liaison, right? Working within that and using their subject expertise. Like Jenny talked about Maggie, our visual, um, visual art librarian um, coming in and doing it there. You know, Jenny does some stuff. Melody Rude does some stuff. So again, it's a team approach to this. And again, if you're interested, uh, no matter what competency you're looking at, uh, I would definitely recommend contacting your liaison librarian or archivist that you're working with for the course. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the Mac and wellness competency, we do have a Canvas organization. Uh, I, you know, would love it to be more active. So if this is something that you are passionate about, um, let me know and I can send this, I can drop it in the chat, whatever. But um, it's an idea that we could share syllabuses, share activities that we're doing, right? Um, and just be, make it more of a community of practice around the competency. And that's it, right? At 127. So, questions, concerns? I'm going to stop sharing. 
Um, and here are all our emails. But again, we can also drop that in the chat if anyone wants anything. And again, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can grab other links to share with y'all. But are there any questions? Um, I'm looking at the, uh, that was really great. Thanks y'all, Jenny, Amy, Sam. I'm looking at the chart here at the bottom with the approved courses. And of course, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, my eyes immediately go to English 101 and 102. Yeah. Um, and I was seeing, uh, I don't, at first I was trying to wonder what the codes meant, but I see, I know what WI means. So obviously I think SI. So I just wanted to, I was curious as to how the MAC curriculum has, um, enhanced, updated, changed the way that English 101 and 102, you know, the curriculum from before. I was just curious because I have no clue. So thank you. Do you want to talk about this, Jenny, or do you want me to? I can talk about it a little bit and you can kind of fill in because okay. I have some gaps. But um, so with the MAC curriculum, one of the things they're trying to do is get away from the markers like WI and SI. Um, while maintaining the sort of value that those have in the curriculum, this idea of um, focusing on, um, you know, for for English 101 and 102, focusing on written communication. Uh, and I think one of the, I don't know much about how English 101 might have changed. I have a feeling it was probably cross-walked in um to mac from how it was but amy can talk more about that um but i do think that one of the things that that um i think it will have very similar overall outcomes but i do my understanding is that they have tweaked some of the actual student learning outcomes to match more directly with the mac outcomes for written communication and one of the great things is that risa applegarth the um uh, director of the college writing program was very involved in developing those outcomes um, and really just very involved. She was not on our uh, revision committee, but she was like really active and engaged in helping us get to the point where the where we could um, most effectively describe what a written communication course could be, because um, I don't think it will surprise anyone here to know that a lot of faculty um, envision English 101 as the course where students learn how to write in all contexts and do research and write about research and you know learn grammar and all the things and that doesn't really happen. So I think one of the things that's really, for me, has been really satisfying about Mac is to see student learning outcomes developed that reflect the reality of what, what's being taught when we are teaching written communication. And I'll let Amy jump in about anything more GEC specific. Yeah, so just like a couple things that popped in my head. So one was that I'm almost like, I'm like 90% sure that English 101 was not a writing intensive class. That's, I think that's true, right, Jenny? It was Yeah, it was a GRD class. Right, um, yeah, it was a, happening. yeah, a reasoning and discourse class. So, um, so the, the WI markers had, you know, revision and those sorts of things in them, but it didn't really have like, like Jenny said, like explicit instruction of writing, which is sort of what people expected that English 101 would do. Um, so yeah, so that's, I think that's a big piece of it is that now we can say, hey, <laughs> there's actual like, writing instruction that happens now at UNCG. So that's good news. And the, the other thing just sort of related to the, the marker situation from the older program was just that it was really complicated. And one of our main sort of marching orders with the MAC program, you know, when we were trying to build this program was that it had to be more streamlined and simpler for students to navigate. So, you know, it, before you had to take like, a WI and then you had to take a WI in your major and then one out of your major and it was very complicated. So, and the other thing, sorry, I'll stop talking in a minute, was that it was possible to, you know, have classes would have multiple markers so that students could take like one class that was WI and SI and also had content. So you had to do writing and speaking and content. And so I think there was sort of a question of like, how well are you doing 
any of these things if you're trying to do them all in one class. So now with the MAC program, the way it is, you have one competency per class and that's really the focus of that class. And, and um, Lois, um, Jenny just said in chat, part of what complicates things is that there are many students still in the older curriculum. Right. So there are still markers out there. And I was told once, and Amy, you can talk about that, is that I mean, you know, we shouldn't say markers anymore, you know, like, but people are still saying it. Like I'm in meetings where, you know, you're talking about the competency people are just like markers and you're like, it's competency now. <laughs> um, Not markers. So, yeah. Right. But, um, it's, but it is both right now. It's both. Right. You know, yeah. Both. That, yeah. That's important to remember is that, you know, right now there are, we're still technically running two, sorry, two general education programs at the same time and will be until almost all of the students who came in before this August have graduated. So you will still see WISI, you'll still see GRD marker, you know, things like that. But yeah, so, but our primary focus from like an assessment perspective is on the MAC program. And Lois asked, have you made any new connections with faculty or classes that you're excited about looking forward to because of these standards? Um, again, I think that one of the things I like about it selfishly is that, you know, as someone who has like more of experience in health and wellness um, competency, you know, I've been put on working groups with faculty in units that I don't necessarily work with. And so I can talk about health and wellness, again, in this very like interdisciplinary way. Like um, I've been working with uh, one of the Mac fellows, who's kind of more the like overarching Mac fellow. And y'all, you know, if y'all remember Francis's like full title, you can um, say it. But um, my point is like, we've been, you know, like I've worked with her a lot on like doing Mac webinars. And then uh, we were, Amy and I were on a HNAC, uh, Humanities Network. And consortium. <laughs> and consortium. I was like, is there an arts in there? So a humanities, you know, faculty network where we were on a panel that we talked about, you know, health and wellness in the humanities, which again, I don't typically work with humanities faculty. Um, so it was cool to hear about their projects and how it really overlaps with a lot of what my faculty that I work with are doing. Um, so for example, there was someone in this panel talking about that he does from religion, where he does his research on um, that vaccines and religious um, uh, orientation. So like how you identify religiously and, you know, how you feel about vaccines. And that, of course, overlaps with a lot of people in public health doing vaccine research. So we, in his class is kind of cross-listed in that way. Um, so again, that's the kind of stuff I've enjoyed. And now Amy and Jenny can talk about, again, new projects they might be working on. So for me, I was really excited to work with that. Um, that counseling class that um, that was on that slide, if you the health and wellness, the stress management, which let's be honest, is the class that we should all take, um, probably, um, because the counseling department is really a graduate program. I think they have like one or two undergraduate classes, but I was really excited, you know, as the librarian for counseling and also as the you know, chair of the general education council that they were like, oh, we can do health and wellness too. And so they teach this stress management class. And um, so I've had a really good time working with them, you know, as they like develop this class, because this is sort of a new, you know, this is a new area for them. Um, so that's been really fun for me. So yeah, I, I'm excited about the opportunity to like jump into the health and wellness stuff as well. Yeah, for me, I would say that's also the case. Um, my liaison areas are um, classical studies, comm studies, um, English media studies, and women's gender and sexuality studies. Um, and uh, English and women's gender and sexuality studies have health and wellness courses. Um, and I have worked with the one, one in English, which is, was a really great experience. Um, and I am hoping to work with the Women's Health and Bodies course that is part of um, the WGSS curriculum. Um, but I'm also, I've been excited to work with the classical studies courses that are foundations courses. Um, one, I worked with the Spartans course this semester. I'm hoping to work with um, a, a classical studies 105, which is about classics and like science fiction and fantasy. Um, and so I'm actually working with that faculty member right now to try to think about where information literacy can fit throughout that course. Um, 
so, you know, I just think anytime we get some, some new courses or some new approaches, it's just a nice, like, just kind of rejuvenating in terms of liaison work. Um, of course, I love all classes that I work with equally, but sometimes it's really nice to have some, some new classes to try some new approaches with. Yeah. And like the last, I think it's cool too. Cause like, I mean, I think in ROI research outreach instruction where liaisons, um, live, I was going to say, but work within that department. Um, it kind of, we have a lot of chances to work together, but to me, this is like a very concrete way that we can say, you know, hey, I have like some health and wellness activities that I do about information literacy. So like Jenny and I could then talk and kind of, you know, she is an expert on information literacy and we can kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, ping ideas off of each other and collaborate and develop these activities. And again, you know, I don't like to say that there's like good things that came out of the pandemic because the pandemic is mostly garbage. But like, I do think like with how online things have been forced to do selfishly as the online learning library, and I think it's cool to see the activities that have developed, you know, to engage people and to live asynchronously. Um, and yeah, done a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, in that way. So yeah, and then Jenny's pointed out, um, you know, yeah, like Juanita said, there's some cool classes out there. I'm jealous. And Jenny says, yeah, why couldn't these courses have been like this as fun a few decades ago? Um, yeah, a lot of faculty UNCG have taken this really fun and interesting ways. Yes. Yes, taking classes for fun. Yeah, I just, I think that's the nice thing about any kind of like, and you know, Amy and Jenny are more experts on this than I am, but I'm always excited to see anything that kind of gets people excited about general education, foundational, like education in this way. Cause I think sometimes we think like, oh, I don't want to teach the 100 level course or like, you know, or sometimes, you know, but I think it's really cool. Like Mac really reinvigorates us to, to think about how we can engage people in these 100 level courses, um, which are so important to the whole career at UNCG um, in different ways. No, it's not, I don't feel like it's been a chore, but I really like like, again, health and I like working with the health and wellness stuff. Um, and I like hearing about, like I liked hearing today. I had, that's the first time I had heard about that Art 105 course. So that sounds really cool. I'm glad we got to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, so I was, as I was working on my slides for this yesterday, um, I texted Maggie and I said, you do stuff with R105. And I was just like really, really inspired yeah. um, by what she, like, I was like, just this idea of a, like sharing videos of artists talking about their research practice. Like what a, what a beautiful, like way to sort of tie things together. Um, and I also really like, I, my understanding is that that course has like 120 students in it, um, every yeah. semester because we have a lot of, you know, fabulous art majors here. And I think starting starting them out thinking about um, this connection between creative practice and research is just like, it's such a great opportunity. So yeah, I, I would love to actually hear Maggie talk even more about yeah. what she's done with them. And I think it's like an inch, like, you know, I mean, I liked hearing about that too, because you can think about, you know, I think it's always useful in terms of information literacy, scaffolding, um, to connect to careers, right? Um, and again, the nice thing about the MAT course is that you're getting non-majors, right? So like, you know, to teach a CTR course where it's not all community and therapeutic recreation students, where you can really kind of, again, have these conver open conversations about health and wellness. Like I'm thinking, Jenny, about when you were working with Heather Adams and she was uh, on that HNAC panel, talked a lot about how like students really talked about how they view health and how health and rhetoric and how they talk about health like in all these very open ways and it was like with some pre-med students who were like I haven't thought about this and this is going to really inform my career right um and so again it just like these are all like to me poster quotes of why you know general education uh is so important for a um university like UNCG particularly I think I just want to piggyback on that and talk about Heather because Sam and I had the opportunity to work with one of Heather's graduate Heather Adams in English her graduate class, which was about the rhetoric of health and medicine. But one of the I thought pretty brilliant ways that she was approaching that class was to try to identify grad students. Um, who might be interested in teaching these undergraduate English health and wellness courses so kind of finding the people who are really. Um, passionate about this and who, again, think about it in those unique ways and are prepared to help our undergraduate students really think and talk about um, 
and I think can talk about health. Um, I, it was a great experience to be able to, to work with them. So Sam and I talked to the students in that class about, um, about Mac as a program and because grad students don't have to take general education courses. Right. And so for many of them, and I mean, I think this is probably the case for, for many of us, maybe we didn't like feel super connected to our general education experience. So we talked to those students a lot about what Mac is and why it's valuable and ways that they, if they were in the, if they were to have the opportunity to teach a Mac course, ways they could talk about why general education matters, why a curriculum like this is not just checking boxes off. And it's really more about, you know, it's about our identity as an institution. It's about, you know, what we think students what, what we value as an institution in terms of learning. Um, so we, you know, I had a great time and we also talked to them about open education resources that they could, that they could use because that's something that um, Heather Adams is really interested in as well. So, you know, I think I, I, I love that, like, like both Sam and Amy have said that there are faculty who are like who wouldn't usually teach 100 level courses, who wouldn't usually teach 200 level courses, um, who are teaching these courses and just doing like such a brilliant job of thinking about them and thinking about how to approach them, of, of guiding students through like a really great and sort of not just in foundations, but overall foundational, um, you know, learning experiences for them to, to bring in. So it's been really rewarding to I did a session earlier today on reflective practice. And as I'm kind of talking through this, I'm reflecting like it's been very rewarding to work with, with faculty in this in this Mac program. The my experience has been like, you know, no one's like, ugh, I'm teaching this because I have to. Um, that no one that I've worked with, I'm sure, you know, and some days we probably all feel that way. But I think that in general, like the folks that I've worked with are just excited and engaged and really want to see like what what this program can do. Yes. So um, we're at 1.45 um, and I wanna be sensitive of time. Um, please note that I did drop links to uh, an assessment about how y'all thought this went. Um, you will get a follow-up email with the recording um, and it will be put on YouTube. Uh, so keep that in mind. I also linked to the webinars page, um, which has a list of all of our winter PD um, series. Um, so the next one coming up, I believe is on GIS. This is the last one in December. Um, we kind of figured if we did this next week, <laughs> no one would come uh, as last you know, we wouldn't be able to get people to host it, understandably. Um, but the next one coming up in this series is January 4th at 2 p.m. And it's uh, GIS the easy way. Um, um, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. I always like to hear about these kind of intro to GIS stuff so that I can learn more. Um, and uh, the uh, last one coming up in the series, there's it's a two part on teaching with primary sources. So from Maggie Murphy, who we mentioned, um, as well as Kathleen Smith. Um, within special collection and university archives and how how we teach uh, with primary sources at UNCG libraries. So please let me know if you have any questions. Again, look out for that follow up email from me and uh, happy holidays, everyone. We're, we're almost there um, to the break. So bye, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.